Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm joined today by Ian Livingston, Chief Constable of Police Scotland, and by Professor Jason Leach, uh, our National Clinical Director. We're starting a bit later today because of the commemorations for VE Day. At 11 o'clock, with members of our armed forces here at St Andrew's House, I observed the two-minute silence, and I'm sure many of you watching at home did the same. On this, the 75th anniversary of VE Day, Scotland remembers all those who lost their lives during the conflict. We think of all the men and women who served at home and abroad, and in doing so, we consider and give gratitude for the incredible legacy of our World War II generation. Their sacrifices ensured the freedoms that we enjoy today. And the challenge they faced then is, of course, very, very different to the one we face today. We are not fighting a war. But we should nevertheless draw strength and inspiration from their example. They showed the necessity and the value of personal sacrifice for the common good. They demonstrated the resilience of the human spirit and our ability to overcome adversity. So as we pay tribute to them for the bravery, dedication and idealism that they showed 75 years ago, let's also thank them for the inspiration they give us today. Our challenge may be different, but just as they did then, we will overcome it. Now, there are a few items I want to cover today. First, as I always do, I will update you on some of the key statistics in relation to COVID-19 in Scotland. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 13,149 positive cases confirmed. That is an increase of 225 since yesterday. A total of 1,584 patients are in hospital with the virus, uh, either confirmed or suspected, and that is a decrease of three from yesterday. A total of 84 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. Uh, that is a decrease of two since yesterday. I'm also able to confirm today that since 5th of March, a total of 3,016 patients who had tested positive and been hospitalised have been able to leave hospital and I wish all of them and their families well. Unfortunately, though, I also have to report that in the past 24 hours, 49 deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed through a test as having COVID-19. That takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 1,811. As always, I will stress that these numbers are not just statistics. They represent individuals, human beings, whose loss is a source of grief to many people. And I want, as always, to send my deepest condolences to everyone who is grieving a loved one lost to this virus. Our thoughts are very much with you. I also want to thank, as I always do, our health and care workers. Once again, last night, I, like so many of you, joined in the applause at eight o'clock. That has become a really important moment of our week right now. And it is just one small, uh, albeit symbolic, but nevertheless important way in which we can, as a country, show our deep gratitude for your extraordinary efforts. Now, before I move on to the main item for today, I want to provide a very quick update on our testing capacity, which is important now, but becomes even more important as we look ahead to the next phase of tackling this virus. Since I updated you this time last week on testing capacity, our capacity within the National Health Service has risen by more than 2,000. And together with the capacity from the Lighthouse Laboratory at Glasgow University, that brings Scotland's total testing capacity now to over 10,000 uh, tests per day. And we expect that number to exceed 12,000 per day by this time next week. And we should remember that we started at the outset of this uh, coronavirus outbreak with a capacity of 350. Uh, so this is a significant step forward, and I want to thank everyone who is playing their part in making that progress possible. The main issue, though, that I want to talk about today is the decision I communicated to you yesterday to extend the lockdown uh, for a further period, while, of course, keeping the situation under ongoing, indeed, daily review. Yesterday, I, with the First Ministers of Wales and Northern Ireland, spoke to the Prime Minister, and I reiterated then that Scotland's lockdown restrictions would stay in place for now. 
Uh, there was, I think, a helpful recognition in that call that the four UK nations may well move at different speeds if our data uh, and t about the spread of the virus says that that is necessary to suppress it. But that we would, of course, continue to coordinate our planning and our messaging as far as possible. And I think that uh, is helpful and welcome. In line with that, I confirmed that the only change we are considering in the immediate term is to the guidance on outdoor exercise. I mentioned that yesterday, and I will give you a further update on that over the weekend. I also emphasised the importance, in my view, of maintaining a very clear stay-at-home message and the Scottish Government's intention to do so for the immediate future. That position is based on our assessment of the evidence and on what we think is right for the protection of people in Scotland. As I said yesterday, we are not yet confident that the all-important R number is far enough below one. In fact, we think the R number here in Scotland may still be a bit higher than in other parts of the UK. That's why sticking with the lockdown measures at this stage is so important. It's key to driving down infection rates and driving down the R number. And that, in turn, is a prerequisite for what we all want to do, and that is begin easing the restrictions. So for now, my message to you remains the same. You must stay at home. Uh, please stay at home. Except for essential purposes, such as exercise or buying food or medicines, you should not be going out. If you do go out, you should be staying more than two metres from other people and you should not be meeting up with people from other households. Uh, you should wear a face covering if you are in a shop or in public transport and you should isolate completely if you or someone else in your household has symptoms. I know how difficult these restrictions are and I know that they will feel especially tough over this long weekend when the sun is out. However, I'm also very confident that the vast majority of you will continue to comply with these rules. After all, you have been magnificent over these past few weeks. By doing the right thing, you have, without a shadow of a doubt, helped us to make really significant progress. And I know that you won't want any more than I do to throw that progress away at this stage. As I said at the start, I'm joined today by the Chief Constable, who will say a little bit more in a moment about compliance and how these restrictions are being enforced. And I want to take this opportunity again to thank all of the police officers and staff who are helping Scotland through this crisis. Uh, you are all doing a difficult job, but you are doing it exceptionally well, and I am hugely grateful to each and every one of you for that. None of us, including me, uh, want these restrictions to be in place for a minute longer than they have to be. But we cannot allow ourselves to become complacent against this virus. By easing the restrictions prematurely, we would risk undoing all the progress that we've made. We would risk allowing the virus to spread out of control, and that would cost lives. So for now, all of us need to continue to comply with these restrictions. It remains our best chance of continuing to slow the spread of this disease, of protecting the NHS and of saving lives. Final issue I want to briefly cover concerns the economic impact of COVID-19. Uh, this morning, as I do every Friday morning, I chaired the Cabinet Subcommittee on the Economy. As usual, one of the key themes we discussed was support for our businesses. We are determined to do everything we can to help Scotland's businesses through this crisis, a crisis not of their making. Uh, yesterday, we launched a new £100 million loan fund for house builders. The fund is aimed at small and medium-sized firms that are facing short-term liquidity problems. We know that house building companies, especially smaller ones, have been really hard hit by the temporary halt in construction activities. This fund will help us to ease any cash flow or liquidity problems that they have, and it will help to safeguard jobs for the future as we work with the construction industry to look at a, a safe restart of their activities. Today, I can announce further support for businesses. Uh, just over a week ago, we launched a £45 million new Pivotal Enterprise Resilience Fund. Uh, that fund will provide grants to small and medium-sized businesses, businesses that are potentially vital to our economic future or to the economy of local areas, but which have been made vulnerable by this crisis. We've already received a very significant number of applications, so today I'm announcing that we will double the size of that fund to £90 million. That's a direct response to feedback from business, and it is part of our commitment to ensure that every penny of consequential funding coming from UK government decisions is passed on to support the economy here in Scotland. 
and I hope it demonstrates our determination to support businesses uh, who are suffering through uh, this unprecedented crisis. Now, I want to close today by reiterating my main message, which is about the importance of staying at home. I know it will be tempting to think that this weekend, after so many weeks of lockdown, we can allow ourselves perhaps one little slip. You might even think, given recent uh, unhelpful news headlines, that things have already eased up and that there's somehow less at stake. I want to emphasise to you as strongly as I possibly can today that that is absolutely not the case. The risk remains too high for us to ease up now. And if we do, all we will do, as well as put lives at risk, is delay the moment when we can start to see that easing. The one time you ignore the guidance, and I want you to remember this, could be the time that you get infected with the virus, or it could be the time that you pass it on to a loved one without knowing it. So please don't throw away all of your good work. Don't put yourselves or your loved ones at risk. The fact is, these restrictions are working. They're helping us to slow the spread of the virus, so we do need to stick with them for a bit longer. And by doing that, it is no exaggeration to say that we will save lives and we will hasten the day when we can and we will return to some semblance of normality. As I said earlier, personal sacrifice for the common good is a lesson we can learn from those whose courage 75 years ago we are remembering today. So I want to thank all of you for making the sacrifices that you are making right now and for doing the right thing. I hope you all stay safe and I hope in these most trying of circumstances you have the best possible weekend. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, the Chief Constable now to say a few words uh, before I hand over to Professor Leach. Thank you, First Minister. Good afternoon. From the beginning of this emergency, I have been clear that policing has an important supporting role to play in helping the national effort to combat coronavirus. Police Scotland's response and our service will be assessed against three things. How the work of our officers and staff to support physical distancing contributes in some way to reduce the mortality rate in Scotland. Secondly, whether through our actions we can maintain and possibly even enhance the very strong relationship of trust that policing has with the public of Scotland. And thirdly, that in doing this we protect the health, welfare and safety of all our officers and staff and their families. What we have seen and experienced across Scotland to date is that communities have stepped forward collectively and as individuals to do their duty to help each other. I want to acknowledge and highlight in particular the significant sacrifices which children and young people are making during this important stage of their lives when many milestone events are arising. To my mind, this reflects the fact that my officers and staff are experiencing high levels of cooperation and consent from our fellow citizens, as policing does our part to support the application of what I acknowledge, as the First Minister has just said, are very restrictive measures on personal freedoms. Reassuringly, we have seen some early indications in some independent surveys commissioned by the Scottish Police Authority that public confidence in policing in Scotland remains solid during this time and is perhaps even higher than it had been prior to this emergency. Now, going forward, we will continue to value the trust of the public and support them during these difficult days. And I'm extremely grateful for the public's support for policing. It is my plea today, underlining what the First Minister has said, for everyone to continue to exercise the self-discipline, commitment and common sense which has thus far served us all well. It is essential to protect the National Health Service and to save lives. Please stick with it. First Minister has discussed how things may change in the future when it is judged safe to do so. We don't know exactly when any changes will come, what they will be, or how they will be viewed. But what I can tell you is that the Police Service of Scotland will continue to act with courtesy and common sense and in line with our values of public service. As I have explained previously, I have commissioned independent expert assurance led by a leading human rights lawyer, John Scott QC, to better understand the effect of the emergency legislation in our communities and help us to discharge our duties consistently and fairly. And it remains crucial that everyone right across the country continues to play their part. Stay home, stay safe and follow the guidance. 
Now, officers will remain visible in communities across Scotland and may speak with you to explain restrictions, encourage you to adhere to them. But where necessary, and bluntly as a last resort, we will enforce the law. At the same time, I want to reiterate that Police Scotland remains here to help and support our fellow citizens to keep them safe in all aspects of their lives. Sadly, for some people, the stay-at-home guidance may expose them to a greater risk of abuse, harm and neglect. I know that private spaces, and indeed virtual spaces, are not always safe spaces for everyone. If you need police assistance, if you need our support or intervention, or if you have concerns about someone else, contact us and we will help. We are here 24 hours a day to support those in need, support those who may be vulnerable, and to ensure fairness and the rule of law. Police Scotland officers and staff are working around the clock, at times putting themselves in harm's way to respond to coronavirus and day-to-day -day policing uh, demands. I reiterate my respect as Chief Constable and my thanks for all that they are doing and will continue to do. And I ask you, the people of Scotland, to please continue to work together during this emergency. It is a shared mission for everyone in Scotland to reduce the spread of the virus, protect each other and save lives. I thank you for your forbearance and your commitment. Stay home, look after yourselves, look after each other and look after your families. Thank you. Thank you, Constable. Um, and Professor Leach, if you want to conclude. Thank you, First Minister. The public applause every Thursday night allows communities to come together up and down the country to show the value and appreciation we have in our health and social care services across Scotland every day. Today, I'd like to say an additional thank you to everyone who is working in the NHS and social care today, a bank holiday, to ensure that we can all continue to have access to the care and treatment that we need. This includes staff in hospitals, in care homes, in GP practices, community pharmacies, and in community settings where they are providing care to people in their own homes. These NHS staff cannot spend the day with their loved ones because they're working to take care of us. And we should recognise and thank them for that. It illustrates that the NHS is open and is there for you. Please do not ignore early cancer signs and symptoms. Certainly don't delay getting checked. If you or anyone in your household notice a rapid deterioration in health, seek help immediately. Please don't ignore the early warning signs of serious conditions such as heart attacks, strokes, asthma, or diabetic collapse. Immunisation appointments are a legitimate reason to leave your home. And now more than ever, vaccinations in children and pregnant women should be up to date. Our childhood immunisation programmes continue and we urge patient, parents to take their children to be vaccinated so they can be protected against very serious disease, including meningitis and measles. Statistics tell us that there is more public confidence in now going to a hospital or a GP practice to be treated than there was just a few weeks ago. Reassuringly, less people would now delay attending their GP or hospital than they would in mid-April, but attendance levels are still lower than usual. For example, normally weekly attendance at A&E across Scotland is around 25,000. In the week beginning the 26th of April, this was 15,000. We also know that urgent cancer referrals are down significantly, but have improved. At their lowest, they were 72% down, and the most recent data suggests they're 59% down. So if you need to see your GP, then you should call. If you need to see your community pharmac pharmacist, you should go. If you want to speak to your midwife, your community nurse, or your health visitor about something that's worrying you, then call them. If you need help out of hours, or you have COVID symptoms that worsen or last more than seven days, then call 111. Of course, if you have an emergency, then don't wait. Call 999 and the NHS will be there for you, just like it is every day. All of this information is available for you on nhsinform.scot. First Minister. Thank you. Now go to uh, journalists who are online to ask questions, starting with Colin White from STD. Good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, Donald, Donald McCaskill, uh, the Chief Executive of Scottish Care, has expressed concern that some home care workers are having to travel long distances to be tested. Many of them don't have cars. Is this something that you're aware of and uh, what will the Scottish Government be doing to address that? 
I have read the comments from Donald McCaskill uh, earlier today. I, I should say, as we've said before, we work very closely with Scottish Care, the Health Secretary, who's uh, not with us today, but she has said this before, uh, that she talks to uh, Donald uh, on a regular basis. So we, we look to pick up these issues and address them as we go along. On, on testing in particular, home care workers are uh, employed by NHS and social care services. Therefore, they should be able to be tested within the arrangements that health boards have and therefore uh, not required to uh, travel long distances. And we can certainly uh, look into making sure that the particular issues that have been raised are, are addressed in that way. When people uh, book a test, which uh, key workers can do through the online portal, uh, and are then directed to one of the drive-through centres, they will be allocated to the drive-through centre closest to their own postcode. And, you know, clearly, uh, the, for some people, that can involve more distance than for others. It's also why, with the assistance of the military, we are trying to get mobile testing units into as many communities as possible. Uh, but let me reiterate the central point that for home care workers, that access to testing should be available through their local health board, uh, which avoids the need to go to a drive-through centre that may be some distance away. Uh, Katie Hunter from the BBC. Afternoon, um, everyone. We've been told by two different organisations in the last 24 hours that not all care home staff who are eligible for testing are going for testing. And that's because their managers are so worried that maybe if 40, 50, 60% of staff test positive, then they'll have to self-isolate. And there simply isn't the staff, there aren't the number of staff to backfill that. There seems to be a trade-off that maybe asymptomatic positive staff looking after residents is, is less risky than no staff looking after residents. I'm just wondering what you make of that, given the number of people still dying in our care homes. See, generally, and I, I make this point not, please, it's not my job to criticise the media and, and I don't want it to be read as that, but any uh, concerns like this that, that are being raised via the media, please make us aware of these things as quickly as possible with even confidenti confidentially the details of what care homes you're talking about so that we can immediately try to, to look into and rectify these issues. Um, one of the things, I'm going to hand over to Jason in a second, but one of the, the, the many things that we have uh, are learning has been developing on uh, around this virus is asymptomatic uh, people and uh, the, the likelihood of uh, them spreading the virus. That's why we do now test uh, some people who are asymptomatic, although we've always taken care to stress that the test that is used we know is most reliable uh, when somebody has symptoms. So if uh, there is a care home with an outbreak, uh, all residents and all staff, uh, now the policy is that they will be tested. Um, and what I'd say on, on the specific point about not wanting staff to be off, off work, if somebody has the virus, uh, even if they are not symptomatic, uh, we they, they should not be at work because that increases the risk of transmission, obviously, because we do now think that people who are asymptomatic might be able to uh, spread the virus to others. And of course, as the health secretary has said uh, on many occasions before, we are working t with uh, home care, sorry, care home providers to make sure that if they have staffing difficulties, then through the returners and the students that we have had volunteer to come in and help, we can provide uh, staff to cover that and there are already NHS staff uh, working in care homes where that is necessary. So somebody should not be at work if they have the virus uh, because there is a worry that hits staffing. Safety and reducing the spread of this virus is the absolute priority and that's why we put arrangements in place to help uh, care homes when necessary. Jason, do you want to add to that? Only to reiterate two, two points. The, the present swab PCR test works best when you have symptoms. It works best in a window where it can find the virus. Increasing evidence around the world suggests that it will also work just before you get symptoms. So two sets of people should be off work, wherever they are, but particularly if they're in care homes. Those with symptoms, irrespective of a test, and those with a positive test, irrespective of symptoms. They should all be off work. Just before this briefing, I was on a phone call with all of Scotland's health board chief executives. And one of the big items we discussed was support for care homes. And we talked about staffing. And they were enthusiastic and positive about helping in those care homes when that was required. And the directors of public health inside the health boards are responsible for that. So if staffing is a challenge, those care homes need to let us know that. And we can put staff in to protect those residents. I mean, I, my simple message to, to 
care home providers, and, and I know they care about making sure their residents are safe as, as much as anybody does, but do not take risks uh, with the, the safety of your residents. Uh, the reason we want, uh, in the circumstances we've set out before, and I won't uh, go over all of that again, uh, staff who are asymptomatic to be tested is so that we can be sure that if somebody has the virus, they are not at work, because if they are at work, um, having had a positive test, then that would be a risk that we don't want you to take. Uh, and there is a, a collaborative approach right now to providing as much support to deal with the implications of that as possible. Uh, Sam Coates from Sky. Um, question first to Ian Livingston. We're not at that stage yet, but when we do come to the moment where the lockdown starts to be eased, do you worry that the job of policing is just going to get more difficult? Do you worry about enforcing a looser lockdown in some places, but a tighter lockdown in some what one minister called micro communities where the virus has flared up? Have you thought through the practicalities of how that might work? And a question for the first minister. The impact of this virus is going to go on for far longer than anyone uh, would have wished with social distancing in place, maybe for a year. Um, this is costing the whole of the UK an enormous amount of money. Do you think the UK government should keep paying for things like the furlough scheme, keeping Brits and Scots at home for however long it takes? Or do you have any worries that the UK wide government might, as there have been hints this week, start to curtail schemes to get debt back under control? Great, thanks. I'll hand over to Chief Constable um, and then I'll uh, round off with the question to me. No, no thank you. Thank you for that. Y yes, absolutely. We have been uh, undertaking a number of uh, plans and uh, contingency uh, uh, planning around what potentially could happen around uh, a potential change in, in the current uh, re restrictions. Um, if there is um, some level of, of easement uh, in the public space, I would expect our officers continu to continue to do what they have been doing, which is to have visibility, uh, to have that preventative uh, engagement uh, with the public that they serve, and to continue to encourage people uh, to adhere uh, to the social distancing uh, guidance for the, the, the broader uh, public health uh, imperative. Um, but equally, there's still going to be a requirement to ensure that people are not gathering in uh, public houses and in premises that should not be opened, that people are not gathering in large numbers in, in private, and we would continue uh, to enforce uh, and to make sure uh, that the law uh, was being upheld. Undoubtedly, I th it is a, a fair comment to say that if, if there are then differences um, in different parts of the United Kingdom, differences for that matter, uh, potentially within the different jurisdictions of the United Kingdom, uh, that would make uh, the, the, the policing role uh, more challenging. But I'm still confident, very confident, that we would be able to respond to that. We've got very, very close ties with all the communities that we serve um, and that we would be very clear that anything that we do do is always with the consent of the public to support them, to explain why there may be changes, why there may be changes to the law, and to ensure that they do everything they can uh, to maintain uh, physical distancing and that we are there to support them and where necessary, where necessary, enforce the law. To, to round off on that, uh, just to make the point from the government perspective that as we consider uh, easing restrictions in the future, we take the view of Police Scotland on the enforceability and the practicality of the changes that we are, are considering. Uh, Police Scotland is a, an integral part of the, the approach we're taking to assessing uh, different uh, restrictions and how they may change in the future because we have to... The, the framework document we published a couple of weeks ago that set out the, the principles and the, the decision-making approach very much had at the heart of that the, the deliverability and the practicality and the enforceability of uh, things that will be in place. There's no point me as First Minister saying we want you to do X if the police are saying there is no way in the world we can enforce that. So we, we make sure we take the, the view of the police as we make these decisions. Um, on the, the point to me, Sam, not, I should preface this by saying none of us are are blind to the, the significant economics and fiscal uh, implications of what we're living through right now and no government um, can ignore that uh, but my view is and we we've had very good and continue to have very good discussions with the uk government who i think have stepped up with the the schemes that are in place right now uh, as long as we are placing restrictions as government for public health reasons on the ability of businesses to operate normally then there has to be some government support to them for that that support may not 
uh, look exactly the same as it looks uh, now in the future. We have to flex depending on uh, the, the changes that are made to respond to the virus. Uh, but we've been very clear that with the furlough scheme in particular, we cannot have uh, premature withdrawal of that and we must absolutely avoid cliff edges to this. So, you know, for as long as we are dealing with this, there is going to be some form of requirement for government support to uh, businesses. And I'd make the point that while, yes, that creates uh, economic and fiscal uh, challenges, Stopping support like that doesn't remove those fiscal challenges. It simply transfers them and they will manifest themselves in other ways. So if we stop supporting businesses, businesses go to the wall, workers are made redundant, then the financial costs of that transfer to the, the benefits bill and, and supporting people differently. So as much of the support should be focused on protecting the productive capacity of the economy so that when this crisis abates, we are able to see that restart again. And we'll continue to discuss these things, hopefully on a uh, cooperative and collaborative way with the UK government as we move forward. Uh, Lindsay Hanna from Radio Clyde. First Minister, what's the point of Edinburgh Airport testing temperatures of people leaving Scotland and no one bothering to test temperatures of passengers arriving? And why aren't you demanding the UK government's border force start carrying out temperature checks on airport arrivals to protect the Scottish public from more outbreaks? Um, thanks for that, Lindsay. Um, I'll hand over to, to uh, Jason on the efficacy or otherwise of temperature checks. You know, you will have heard us say before that temperature checks are not necessarily uh, very reliable in determining whether somebody has the virus or not. Uh, on the question of why I'm not demanding things, I, I've stood at this podium a few times in the last couple of weeks and said that this is an issue that we are uh, looking to see uh, that we think does have to play a, a more central role in the next phase of, of dealing with this virus and these are discussions we uh, have been having with the UK government. I think it is likely it's uh, a reserve matter, it's not for me uh, to go into the detail of it but I know the UK government is looking at this issue and whether it happens over the weekend or in uh, a different time scale to that I would expect the UK government to say something about how it intends to deal with borders and the advice and health interventions it would intend to make to people coming into the country and uh, we've been involved in those discussions in recent days and will continue to be involved in the detail because some of the delivery of that although it's a reserve matter generally in terms of port health for example would fall uh, very much to the Scottish Government and our partners to implement. Jason do you want to say a bit more about temperature checks? The, the World Health yeah. organisations say that ports and entry points into your country are, are, are crucial and we have to take that very very seriously. Unfortunately it's not a simple tests that you can just do. Temperature checks are not very reliable at that kind of level. They may give us a little bit more information, but actually the clinical science says the most important thing is probably to isolate and give information to arrivals and teach them what they should do on arrival. And that's something that we have been doing and we will continue to do if the rules change. And the clinical and scientific advice is, is very clear that you have to treat those ports of entry to your country very, very carefully. Thank you. Uh, Trine Bussey from PA. Um, I too wanted to ask about policing and really what the concerns about the continued policing of the lockdown would be if there is a difference in the restrictions north and south of the border. Um, and I'm also interested in the fact that while the SPA survey that was published yesterday showed a large number of Scots are satisfied with the approach that Police Scotland is taking, it also showed a significant number of people, I think 28%, think that the police should be taking a tougher approach to enforce the lockdown, which presumably means that they are seeing breaches of lockdown which aren't being dealt with in any way. I'll hand over to the Chief. I, on differences north and south of the border, I, I've, I've made very clear my view. We have to do in Scotland what the, the data tells us is, is necessary to suppress the virus and protect the population. And I think there is now a recognition uh, UK-wide that it may be that uh, the four nations will not go at the same pace uh, throughout all of this, but that doesn't mean we don't coordinate our, our messaging. Um, following my discussion yesterday, though, and, and despite the more lurid headlines yesterday morning, um, which we can speculate on uh, where, where they came from and why, um, I would anticipate that in the immediate term, as in Sunday into Monday, any differences will be probably quite minor, um, but obviously we'll wait and see what the Prime Minister announces, but I, I wouldn't anticipate a radical departure in the immediate term if what the 
the sense I'm getting for, from the UK government now um, turns out to be the reality. But, Chief Constable, do you want to uh, address the point from your perspective? Yes, no, thank you for that. Um, again, I, I, as I said earlier, I, I think it is a fair observation to, to make that if, if there is a significant difference um, between the law in England and Wales and the law in Scotland, in terms of the public's understanding and the public's awareness, and therefore the public's ability uh, to, to comply with that, um, that would give um, an additional factor that, that we would need to deal with. Having said that, I, I think the people of Scotland are used to the fact that there is a, a separate legal system in Scotland, there's a, a separate police service in Scotland, it's been in the, the distinct nature of Scots law has been established for, for centuries, um, and there are distinctions uh, across the board, the drink driving uh, being one uh, example of that. Um, so, in terms of the current public health emergency, um, I think that the consistency of the message, as the First Minister has outlined about stay home, stay safe, only go out if you need to, I think does make it easier to police, and there will be challenges if there is uh, some, some change to that between the position in England and Wales and Scotland. But we will monitor that very, very carefully, and um, we'll be in a position to quickly respond to that, um, should that arise. In terms of the public attitude surveys, we're constantly looking for feedback. I think it's difficult to make any uh, extrapolation on, on that figure uh, of 25-28% about why people uh, feel, feel that way. What I do know is that during this really, really difficult time, really difficult time for any public servant, but particularly the police service, um, which are there at, at, at the front end of supporting and enabling um, these quite remarkable uh, limits on, on personal freedom, on personal liberty, uh, to see an increase in, in levels of public confidence that we've seen, not only from the Scottish Police Authority assessment, but from our own work that we've done, where we've been serving over 15,000 people and actually seen an increase in the level of, of trust and confidence. Um, I take that uh, to be a reassuring message about how officers and staff are, are going about our business, but we keep it under constant review. Uh, that's why I've asked for independent assessment, independent assurance, and we'll continue to monitor it, um, because as things develop, uh, undoubtedly the policing challenge will continue to be, be a hard one, but one I think we will, we will undoubtedly be able to, uh, to meet. Thank you. Uh, Michael Blackley from the Daily Mail. Hi, good afternoon. At the Downing Street media briefing yesterday, it was confirmed that the R number for the UK is between 0 0.5 and 0 0.9, with London being the lowest figure. Um, can you confirm, does Scotland have the highest figure for this of any part of the UK? Um, and also, just to pick up again on the furlough issue, have you been given any reassurance that if Scotland moves at a different pace out of lockdown, will the furlough scheme continue in Scotland, even if it isn't operating in other parts of the UK? Well, the furlough scheme is not about to end over the next couple of weeks. It is going to continue for uh, the next uh, period. So that is not an immediate issue uh, anyway, but we would continue to have these discussions should your eventuality come to pass. Um, in terms of the uh, question about the R number, I mean, I've, I think, several times this week alone, I've said what our estimate, and you, you started off by saying it's been confirmed. These are estimates for all parts of the UK. They're, they're based on models uh, with data uh, being inputted into to these models. We think our, our number is somewhere between 0.7 and 1. Uh, we can't rule out it being still closer to the 1 than the 0.7. And we think, uh, based on these estimates, that it might be uh, a bit higher than uh, other parts of the UK. And by that, I mean in the other nations. Obviously, I don't know what it, the R number is looking like in the different regions of, of England. So I couldn't say that there's no region of England that would not be higher than Scotland um, but that's that's our estimate and we want to see I certainly as first minister I, I want to see I think I said this yesterday I, I want to see another you know week's data that gives me more confidence that we're on that clear downward trajectory I'm particularly keen to see the national records of Scotland figures on Wednesday next week and hope we will see that the reduction in deaths that was reported on Wednesday this week has continued this is all about you know the data has to inform our decisions. Ultimately, it's people like me that has to apply that data and apply our judgment to that data and take decisions. But I want to have more confidence than I have right now that we are on that clear downward tra trajectory, that we're getting infection rates down and we're getting the R number more comfortably below one uh, than we feel it is right now. Do you want to add anything on R numbers? No. Uh, 
Tom Peterkin from the P&J, or Thomas, as uh, he's on my list as. Thank you. Thank you, First Minister. Um, in Wales, the, the First Minister in Wales has talked about, um, as well as um, um, extending exercise from more than just once a day, about opening garden centres, libraries and recycling centres. I'm wondering what the prospect of those relaxations in Scotland, and also, can you give any guidance on on, on the future for things like golf courses, bowling greens, tennis courts, whether that um, those being reopened is, is, is in sight? I actually spoke to the First Minister of Wales earlier this morning, so I'm uh, aware of uh, what he was due to announce, having done uh, his uh, statutory review of, of the restrictions. Um, in terms of uh, the... He announced uh, an extension on outdoor exercise, um, which is the only thing, as I've said a couple of times already and repeated today, is the only thing right now we are looking at in the immediate uh, term. Some other things may follow not too long after that, but right now it is the extension of outdoor exercise that we are looking at. We're currently assessing the, the advice and the evidence and uh, looking at exactly what the parameters of that would be. And as I've said, I will give a further update on that over uh, the weekend um, to make sure there is clarity for people about the change that we are, are talking about. Uh, basically, at the starting point for that is what you're allowed to do once a day right now. Uh, you will be allowed to do more than once a day, but you know what the limits on that are and what the parameters of that will be, we will set out over the weekend. What I want to stress, though, is until then, the once a day exercise rule uh, remains in place uh, as set out in our current guidance. Uh, Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Uh, just following up from Tom's question, really, can you, um, I mean, the, the Welsh Government press release has said these adjustments will come in Monday, quote, so Wales moves in step with the rest of the UK, but obviously that, that isn't the case in terms of Scotland. What would you say to people who are frustrated, um, confused about why people in Wales and England can go to a garden centre, a library or a recycling centre, um, whereas people in Scotland are the only people on the British mainland who can't? Firstly, you don't know that's the case with greatest respect, Simon, because Wales has made an announcement today, England hasn't, and, and Scotland hasn't either on, on the limits of outdoor exercise. But if there are differences, and I think all four nations now uh, accept that there may be differences in pace in how we do these things, because uh, the, the state of the infection, the, the level of the virus, is at different stages because of the timing we went into this infection curve that we may all be slightly uh, at different stages on it. So what I would say to people if we get into eventualities like that is if, if you're not being allowed to do something in Scotland that you are being allowed to do in other parts of the UK or vice versa, it's because we judge here that it's still necessary to save your lives from, uh, or to save you from getting this virus and potentially save your life if you became seriously unwell, that we're asking you for a little bit longer not to, for example, go to garden centres. So I know there is always potential for confusion, but to, to allay that is one of the reasons I stand here every day to make sure that if you want to know what you should be doing, and therefore not doing in Scotland, you get a very clear message about that. And, and everything I'm advising people to do or not to do right now is only driven by the desire to protect people from this virus. And if some things are necessary for that purpose for a little bit longer in Scotland, then I, I hope people will, will realise and understand that that's a price worth paying not to put all of our progress into reverse. Uh, Libby Brooks from The Guardian. Thanks, First Minister. Um, both you and the Chief Constable have emphasised this very strong stay-at-home message today, and I just wanted to ask if you've got further evidence that people are taking guidance less seriously this week. Um, I don't have evidence that says that's the case. Um, you know, I, I said, a, a, was it earlier this week or last week, that we did see some evidence from uh, transport statistics that more people were on the roads, more people were using uh, buses. So, and some people will be out for perfectly legitimate reasons. Um, it's not always the case if you see people in the street that they are breaking the rules. There will be, uh, they'll be out for some of the, the reasons they are entitled to be out for. But it is not surprising so many weeks into lockdown that people become a bit frustrated and impatient, which is why it is really important to continue to remind people why we're asking you uh, to live your life under these restrictions right now. It is 
it is not something I take any pleasure in asking people to do. It is because we have made so much progress. This is working and we need to do it for a bit longer to make sure we don't see that progress reverse. Think of it at the moment as being like a bit of a crossroads. Uh, we can keep going down the right path by just sticking with it for a bit longer and getting the R number and the infection levels lower, which then gives us more confidence to start easing things, or we can all get frustrated now and go down the wrong road, in which case I'll be standing here for a lot longer telling you that these restrictions have to stay in place, and unfortunately probably having to announce even grimmer statistics around serious illness and death. So please stick with it for a bit longer. Ian, in terms of the, the policing uh, perspective on that, I, mean, I think we're in the same position as everyone, and, and um, including the, the inference from Libby's question, that the people do have a sense that there are there is more movement. As you said, First Minister, there's more uh, more movement round from from transport figures that, that tells us that. Um, our impression, and, and having engaged regularly with with urban communities, rural communities, islands communities, all the communities across Scotland, is that I think people are actually also adjusting. To the regulations and, and, and to the guidance. Um, if anything, I think maybe in the early days and, and, and weeks uh, there was there was a, a, a very very um, not only a compliance with the requirements, but actually a number of businesses, a number of people who had uh, uh, were, were in business or were performing functions that actually were were central to uh, the national interest. A number of them actually uh, uh, closed. So we've seen a number of businesses uh, reopening, but actually reopening entirely legitimately. Um, we are having to maintain a level of engagement to find out exactly what lies uh, behind uh, people's presence in, in public, um, but we're going to continue uh, to, work, to work with them. I, I, do, think, I do think that, that uh, there has been remarkably high levels uh, of, of consent, of support, uh, and, and from that, high levels of, of compliance. But I think, undoubtedly, in, in recent days and weeks, we have seen more people uh, physically uh, in public, um, but a number of them there are, are undoubtedly there for legitimate reasons. And we will only know that when we engage with them, when we speak to them, and they explain their circumstances. I think I mean, Ian's point, which anecdotally is one I've picked up at the, uh, the very outset of this, the, the level of anxiety that we all had and, and still have, that meant that there were some people who, who weren't uh, necessarily going out even for the purposes that they are permitted to go out for these uh, essential purposes, just deciding to stay at home. So some of what we're seeing now will be people you know, understanding what is permitted, understanding how to keep themselves safe when they're going out and going out for these permitted purposes. Um, but I'd say, again, if that's not the case for you, if you, in the last days or week, have been going out when you really know that you shouldn't have been uh, maybe going to see people you shouldn't have been seeing or, or going out for purposes that are not essential, I would really ask you and appeal to you to think about that and, and not to do that because that is what starts to put all of this progress in jeopardy and, and I know none of you want to see that just as, as I don't want to see it. Scott McNabb from the Scotsman. Uh, yeah, uh, First Minister, um, the UK government does seem to be um, rowing back on the scale of changes which are likely to be announced by the um, Prime Minister on Sunday. But given what you've uh, mentioned earlier about the messages which were coming out previously, are you concerned about the, the way it's been um, handled um, by the UK government? And also, looking forward, you, you have alluded to the fact that we may now move out of lockdown at different speeds across the UK. Will the Scottish government have to look at uh, possible contingency measures to insulate the country from any second wave that emerges uh, from England if it transpires uh, exited a bit too early? Well, look, I, I would hope, if, if there is a different pace, I would hope it's because the evidence it points us in that in different parts. So if England moves out of certain measures before we do, it's because the evidence in England says that's safe to do. I, I really hope we don't see a premature lifting of, of measures in any part of the country, um, of the UK. And, and I think it's important to understand that Different UK nations going at a different pace doesn't mean any of us are doing anything prematurely. It is because the evidence is saying that different times is appropriate. So I think you're you're taking me into completely hypothetical territory right now, which I you know I will consider that should it become other than hypothetical. But while it's still hypothetical, we'll uh, not uh, I'll not get drawn into that. Um, in terms of your your question, as I said earlier on, having spoken to the Prime Minister, and you know obviously he'll set out what he sets out on. Uh, Sunday, I would remind people, as uh, I think 
the Welsh First Minister uh, or the Welsh Government has done. Remember when the Prime Minister speaks on, on Sunday uh, that what these restrictions are in place separately in all four nations of the UK. We all have our own legal responsibility to review them and keep them under review. So apart from on clearly reserved areas like border control, what the Prime Minister announces in terms of easing up of restrictions will be for England. And then, as Wales has done today, have set out their position, as we will do and Northern Ireland will do separately. Um, but I would expect the changes, based on my conversation with them, if there are any uh, variations between us, to be minor at, at this stage. And, and obviously, I'll talk more in detail about that once we actually see what he's going to announce. Um, beyond that, you know, we, we are where we are now, and I want us to move on and, and move forward on the collaborative basis that I think is best for all of us. Yesterday's newspaper headlines were not helpful for anybody, and I, I suspect uh, the UK government probably agrees with that because they they risk undermining the clear message which is stay at home and follow the guidance so I was pleased to hear the UK government uh, sort of clarify that yesterday and I think it's really important that in all of our messages we, we are absolutely clear and straight with people and right now the message hasn't changed stay at home except for the essential purposes that you know it is permitted for you to leave home. Uh, Chris Musson from The Sun. Uh, hi. Um, on the outdoor exercise issue, um, to the First Minister, um, a lot of people are fortunate to have gardens, unlike people who live in, say, high-rises. Um, how much does it concern you that the lockdown and your one-hour-once-a-day rule is disproportionately affecting the least well-off people in society? And to the Chief Constable on this issue, has Police Scotland actually issued any penalties to anyone solely for exercising too long or more than once because um, I'm not sure you can even do that in law can you because the legislation does not state the frequency or duration of exercise that's permitted. Um, so I'll hand over to the Chief Constable but just as a point of fact on that the, the once a day is in guidance not in the regulations the regulation talks about the permitted reasons the defences uh, to uh, if you were out of challenged on being out of your home, but the, the, the once a day is in the guidance. So in, in that sense, Chris, you're, you're right in, in that distinction. Um, I'll hand over to, to, to Ian about the uh, police uh, enforcement around uh, exercise. On the, the point, I mean, it's been a constant um, consideration, concern, worry in my head uh, all through this about the differing experiences of people who live in houses with gardens compared to those who live in tenement flats, particularly families with children who can't get out and, and sit in a garden, uh, particularly when the weather has been uh, as it has been uh, lately. So that has been one of the, the main reasons why, and I said this on Tuesday, I have been as keen as, as possible to, as quickly as possible, get to a position where we could relax the once a rule, uh, once a day uh, piece of guidance. Because I do think that as well as getting to a point of confidence that that in itself won't impact adversely on uh, the R number or infection rates, we do know that that will have a positive effect on equity and on well-being, which is why I'm so keen to be able to get to that position. And on more of the detail of that, I will, as I said earlier on, uh, talk more over the weekend. Ian. Well, th thank you. And, and, and th thanks for the question. I think, I think what underlines the question is... The, quite a significant issue, which is what is the relationship between the, the guidance and, and the regulations. And, and again, I think it's, it's a fair observation to say that at times um, uh, people uh, can mistake one for the other. In terms of the actual issue of the fix, fixed penalties, I've, I've absolutely no doubt in my own mind that given the, the demands on the police service, given the, 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 the variance in, in human conduct that exists right across uh, the whole of Scotland, there will have been times um, where a fixed penalty uh, notice may have been issued, and um, where at, in actual fact it, it would have been inappropriate to do so. I can't, I can't reply specifically to Krista on, on, on that particular point that you make, but it, it is an issue, I think, that John Scott's group um, will be looking at. But what I would say, and, and again we've had instances of this, is that when it's been brought to our attention that in actual fact, um, in, in all good faith, a fixed penalty notice has been issued in circumstances that were inappropriate, that fixed penalty notice has been withdrawn. Uh, we've apologised, we've spoken to the officers involved, we've spoken to the members of the public. It's the nature of this emergency set of circumstances that the regulations that were brought in literally overnight 
um, and then the police service had to pick them up. We needed to issue guidance and, and, and operational uh, practice. Um, what I would say, and, and when I look at it as, as the Chief Constable, but also as a citizen, is that the essence of it is that you, you, you cannot be outside um, your own home unless you have a reasonable excuse. And I think the guidance gives you some indication of what that reasonable excuse is. But in actual fact, until uh, there is some level of judicial determination on each and every single reasonable excuse, it is very difficult. And I, I, I don't think we should seek to be overly uh, prescriptive. I would come back to, to my plea for everybody to act with reasonableness, everybody to act with common sense. Um, but undoubtedly, if there is a set of circumstances where somebody has been issued uh, with a fixed penalty notice and circumstances where they shouldn't have, uh, that will be withdrawn. Uh, we'll make rectification around that. But I would ask everybody uh, to please, you know, pl thank you for your forbearance. You need to continue to work with the police service. These, these, are, these are difficult issues for everyone, um, but it's one I think collectively we will, we will come through it. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Mark McLaughlin from The Times. Hello there. Um, a quick one for the Chief Constable. Um, is the daily record splash today that police are going to turn away people at the border true? And, and maybe a more detailed one for Jason Leach. Uh, Jason, can you put a wee bit more meat on the bones to what the CMO said yesterday about Sweden? Because I know you've been looking into this. Um, you would have read the letter in the Lancet from somebody who could probably be classed as a counterpart to yourself in Sweden, saying lockdown's just delaying the inevitable. Everyone's going to get it anyway. We're not going to outrun this with a vaccine. Um, you know, wh why is he wrong? Uh, Ian, do you want to uh, take that first? I did see that, uh, that front page this morning. Um, straightforward answer is no. We have no intention of doing that. I think that's uninformed speculation, uh, given the fact the amount of debate and discussion that, 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 that's been arisen. Uh, we have no intention of, of having any roadblocks on the English-Scottish uh, border. Uh, we'll engage with members of the public um, just as we would um, in, in the Scottish border, just as we would in the Scottish Highlands, but uh, there's absolutely no intention to, to have roadblocks on the Scottish-English border. Okay, thank you. Um, and Jason, do you want to take on this? Mark, thank you for your question. You, you know uh, better than most about the comparisons we're doing between countries and, and each of those countries we're looking at. I think there are things to learn from Sweden and things Sweden could learn from us. Uh, I, I don't agree that every country will end up in exactly the same place. I think one of the challenges with that letter and that system is the protection of the vulnerable piece. So what we've tried to do in Scotland is balance individual freedoms, of course, but also with a group of shielded and a group of high risk who we've asked to do slightly different things from the rest of the population. I, I, th I think when we look back, that, that will have been the right thing to do for those sections of our communities. Sweden has done things slightly differently. They also have a very different demographic. They have less inequality, for one thing. They live on flatter surfaces, if that makes sense. They don't tend to live in high rises like we just described and discussed. So, so you have to make nuanced decisions by country. And then there will, of course, be lessons that the WHO will hold for all of us, from Sweden, from Scotland, from, from other parts of the world. And we continue to, to monitor that and try and learn as much as we can from it. Goes by right now, and this will continue to be the case where we don't get asked to comment on a, a range of opinion, expert, academic, and, and other kinds of opinion that span a spectrum. So, you know, I, I think I got this yesterday in the briefing where you asked about uh, Sweden, but also got questions as we do. So, they go from, you know, lockdown was too late and not severe enough, and therefore, if you'd only done it quicker and tougher, things would have been different through to. You're what you've quoted from Sweden, Sweden, lockdowns don't make any difference because at the end of the day, everybody will end up. So there's an everything in between. What we have to do and have done and will continue to seek to do is take the decisions we think are right for the circumstances we are in, informed as much as possible by the, the data and the expert opinion. And, you know, uh, there will come a point when we're out of this pandemic, which we, we all uh, look forward to, to that day, when there will be a look back at what countries did and, and you know, what the, the experience then tells us was was good, bad and indifferent. And that will be important learning. But right now, we're all trying to make the best decisions for the people uh, that we serve and represent. And that will continue to be the case. Uh, David Ball from The Herald. Uh, 
Thank you, First Minister. Um, in the Scottish Government's test trace isolate framework, um, it suggests that the turnaround between tests and results being issued need to rapidly reduce for people to be isolated effectively. Um, how practically is that likely to work and how much of a challenge will that, will that be when mass testing is um, eventually rolled out? One of the challenges around the test trace isolate is to reduce the turnaround time for tests because obviously the quicker the test result, then the, the quicker the rest of the, the system kicks in. Um, these are That is one of many things that we are uh, working through in detail right now to make sure we've got a, a workable, effective, robust test trace isolate uh, system in place. In fact, I, I'm going from uh, this briefing into a, a detailed session with expert advisors on exactly uh, these issues uh, later this afternoon. So it's, it's one of those issues that we will clearly be looking at and considering. Jason, do you want to say any more about that? Oh, only that these things will happen in sequence. You're absolutely right. The testing piece has to be fast, as fast as the science and the laboratories will allow us to have. But if you have symptoms, we won't wait for the test. We will begin the tracing process. So we will be ready when that positive test comes back. So actually, you might be isolated and then be told the test result on X was actually negative. So we're very sorry. We know you had to isolate for 24 hours, but now you can go, go back out. So, so we, they don't exist in, in just isolation of one another. Each element will run in parallel. And of course, the quicker the test, the quicker we'll be able to be definitive about those who are isolated. OK, thanks. And last question is from Vivian Aitken of The Daily Record. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, yesterday, the World Health Organization said there had been an increase across Europe of about 60% of women calling uh, 999 for domestic abuse. Um, cited in those figures were UK. I just wondered if the Chief Constable can give us any indication of any increases in domestic violence um, that he's seen so far. And also, the WHO um, talked about different measures that were being taken around Europe um, from Italian apps asking for help without phone calls, pharmacists in Spain and France alerted by code words um, down to Greenland limiting the, the, the amount of alcohol to protect the home environment and make it safer for children. Are any of these things under consideration by the Scottish Government? I'll hand over to Chief Constable um, to answer that substantively, but we, I mean, Obviously, we look at a range of different ways in which we can support people who want to report domestic abuse and who may find it difficult to do so, particularly right now when they may be finding it difficult to get away from uh, the abusive partner and uh, you know silence on the line when somebody phones 999. Uh, for example, we've also given at an early stage of the coronavirus uh, outbreak is uh, we've, we've given additional funding to organisations like Rape Crisis and Scottish Women's Aid um, and also made sure that the helpline uh, remains available for people because from the outset of this it has been a point that has been on all of our minds that home is for many people not a safe place and we have to be even more mindful of that at a time when we're asking everybody to stay at home than we would be in normal times. Now Ian do you want to say a bit more? Yeah no I, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for the question because as, as I said in my opening uh, remarks we absolutely recognise, as, as, as indeed you said, First Minister, that we're asking people to stay home, but actually, for some people, that, that is a dangerous place uh, to be. Um, in terms of our recorded incidents, we haven't seen a significant uh, increase in uh, incidents of uh, domestic abuse or domestic violence, uh, but in truth, um, I think that does hide um, some suppressed vulnerability and, 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 and suppressed risk. Uh, and it actually also applies in regard to child concerns and, and child protection issues. We're working very, very closely with our colleagues in local authorities, our colleagues in, in, in health, and crucially, absolutely crucially, uh, with the third sector, um, with Scottish Women's Aid, with Rape Crisis Scotland, uh, with Children First, with a number of, of third sector partners who do an awful lot uh, to support uh, victims and, and to, to offer some level of protection. In terms of our proactivity, uh, we're seeking to be proactive uh, when it comes to people who we know uh, have a, a, a history of domestic violence, of domestic abuse. Um, we're seeking to ensure as best we can that support is given uh, to people uh, who may have been victims in, in the past. Uh, and we're encouraging uh, as much as we can uh, people and neighbours uh, to, to, to look out uh, for, for each other. Um, I said again in, in some of my opening remarks, this, this is very much 
a, a matter of, of, of looking out um, for uh, the vulnerable individual, whether it's an elderly individual living by themselves or whether it's somebody that you know uh, might be uh, under, under some level of, of danger. But it's, it's a concern. Um, we're looking at as many uh, mechanisms and, and means as we can. There are many agencies and individuals involved in it. Um, and it's something that is, is absolutely at, at the forefront uh, of, of our efforts. It also applies, as again, as I said, in terms of some of the vulnerability that people may be experiencing in the online space, uh, where people are being exploited, people are being defrauded, and particularly people who perhaps had not uh, are, are now new to, to the use of the, the internet and, and, and uh, are, are now new to living parts of their life in, in the virtual space. Uh, so in terms of our work, we're doing an awful lot of work with key partners um, I think it's an, it's, a, it's an important and legitimate question that you raise uh, and one that's in the forefront of, of, of my mind as Chief Constable about how we as a service continue to try and keep people safe through this, these really difficult times. Thank you, Chief Constable. Um, that concludes our list of questions for today. Can I uh, thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you to the journalists, as always, for uh, their questions. Uh, my thanks to Professor Jason Leach. Uh, my thanks in particular to the Chief Constable for joining us uh, today. And again, uh, let me record my thanks to police officers across the country for the, the very hard but good work that all of you are doing right now. Uh, my thanks to Rachel, our uh, sign language interpreter for today. Um, I'll be back here with you on Sunday. The provisional time for a briefing on Sunday is the normal Sunday time of 2.30, but look out on social media, that may change. Uh, we are uh, expected to have Four Nations discussions through the COBRA forum on Sunday, which may necessitate uh, a change in the timing of this briefing, but we will make sure information on that is relayed uh, through social media. Um, in the meantime, can I again thank you for your cooperation and for all of the sacrifices you are making that are helping us to get this virus under control and to save lives and protect our National Health Service. Um, I don't uh, want to be in the position of asking you, particularly on a, a bank holiday Friday when the sun is shining, to have to stay at home for longer, but I am doing so because it is necessary. If we stick with this for a bit longer, we will get these numbers lower and we will then get to the stage where we can start to think about getting back to some form of normality. So please, please stick with it. Uh, you are making a real difference and I am deeply grateful to all of you for that. So thank you very much for joining us uh, today and I will see you again here on Sunday.